Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn, and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. This quarter, we are studying God's mission, my mission, and today is Lesson 8, Mission to the Needy. I so appreciate this quarterly study. It was kind of, uh, we had many contributors, let me put it that way, the directors of the Global Mission Center and Adventist Mission all contributed and even a few retired directors and we want to thank them for their work. Let me introduce your family, my family, the Sabbath School panel, Ryan Day. Amen, yeah, I have a lesson, uh, well, Monday's lesson entitled Christ's Method Alone. I'm excited about it. Amen, and James Rafferty. Good to be here, Shelley. I have Tuesday's lesson, Refugees and Immigrants. Wonderful, Daniel Perrin. Thank you, I have Wednesday's lesson to help the hurting. Oh, wonderful, mm. and Jill Morricone. Thank you so much, Shelley. On Thursday, we look at greater love. I love this lesson and I appreciate what each of you bring to the table from your studies. Jill, would you like to pray for sure. us? Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and we thank you that you've called us to mission and that you call us to mission to those who need it most. We ask right now as we open up your word, would you open up our minds and hearts yes, to receive what the Spirit has for us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our memory text, and I, I wish you'd make this an affirmation from scripture and mm. speak it over your life. Jesus said, the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. That's Matthew 25, 40. We, our destiny, is to become like Christ. Mm -hmm. We are to, he lived by the law of love. We are to live by the law of love. We are to reflect his love, his light and his mm. life to the world. And as we draw close to others and meet their needs, we are reflecting Christ. And it's interesting mm -hmm. that Jesus said, when we do the works of God, we're fulfilling the law of love and we're actually ministering to him. Mm. Boy, that really opens your eyes. Minister to others, minister to Christ. The quarterly says in this week's lesson, our topic, Mission to the Needy, shows that God has a plan to reach those who might be needy in any number of ways. Their needs might be physical, emotional, financial, or even social. That is, mm. some might be deemed as outcasts from their community or family. Whatever the needs are, we must be ready to do what we can do to help. This is a central part of what it means to be a Christian and what mission must include. So by helping the needy, those in need, we are ministering to Christ. Mm -hmm. I love Sunday's lesson, the faith of friends. And if you will open your Bible to Luke chapter five, we are going to study a story that we find also in Matthew nine and Mark two, but this is Luke chapter five, verse 17. And Luke writes, Now it happened on a certain day, as he, Jesus, was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. The event mm -hmm. happened in Capernaum. Mm -hmm. Now there was beginning a controversy between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. And they were watching him. He had reports of miracles, of healing the sick, healing lepers, and reports that he was someone more than just a rabbi. So these Pharisees and teachers of the law came from all parts of the country, even as far away as 80 miles from Jerusalem. They came to investigate him, to catch him. No doubt they were trying to find fault with him. 
and make charges against him. Mm -hmm. So here in Capernaum, then Luke mentions in the rest of Luke 5, 17, the B part, it says, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The power of the Lord, the healing power of the Holy Spirit was always residing in Jesus. And then in 5, verse 18, then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. Now let's just hit the pause button. Here we've got a group of men carrying a paralytic man on a stretcher. And these four stretcher bears couldn't get through the crowd that was beginning to gather outside the house. They were listening to Jesus. Mm -hmm. he, they couldn't get into Christ's presence. But you know what? Even though a barrier, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes people can be a barrier to get to Jesus, mm -hmm. but even though the barrier existed, these men were determined. They had such a determined faith. They were gonna find another way. So it goes on in verse 19. And it says, they went up on the housetop. They let them down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. Determined faith caused them to think outside the box. How often do we think of mission or ministry or leading to people, you know, uh, to people, to God? in only one way. We've got to start thinking outside the box. Maybe we need to go to the roof that's that ceiling in our head and remove some tiles mm -hmm. so that we can lower the needy before Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Jesus loved to see faith in action. Just imagine how he felt when he saw all five men had the faith. The man on the on the stretcher had faith too. But He's, it says in verse 20, when he saw their faith, he said to him, the paralytic, man, your sins are forgiven you. Mm. Now, this is an unmistakable claim mm -hmm. to deity. Mm -hmm. And there are Pharisees that are standing by, watching, trying to catch him. And verse 21 says, the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You know, the, the reaction of the unbelieving Jews, they reasoned correctly in their minds that it was blasphemy to claim to forgive sins unless yeah. you were God. Mm -hmm. The one thing they weren't thinking, even though they'd heard all these reports of Jesus, they just failed to consider that Jesus was God. So verse 22, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, rise up and walk. You know, Jesus, is reading their minds and their hearts. Mm -hmm. He knows what's in their hearts. And he's pointing out that, I guess anyone could say your sins are forgiven. How would you prove that? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way to prove that. So which is easier to say that <laughs> or to say rise up and walk? And what we've got to recognize is that that power, both of them, whether it's to forgive sins or to, to heal, There's, the source of that power is God. Mm -hmm. So to prove that he had authority to right. forgive sins, what does he do? He heals the man. Verse 24, he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately the man rose before them. He took up what he had been lying on and he departed to his own house, glorifying God. Oh, can you imagine mm. being completely paralyzed and now you're healed. Jesus gave him 
a double blessing. He forgave his sins and he healed his physical malady. Mm -hmm. One encounter with Jesus can change a life. So verse 26 says, they were all amazed and they glorified God. This is the crowd now. The crowd that's in the house, the crowd that's outside of the house, listening through the doors and the windows. Mm -hmm. And they were all amazed, Luke said, and they glorified God. And they were filled with fear. And they said, we have seen strange things today. You know, Luke is the only one who records the three reactions of the people. Mm -hmm. They were amazed, mm -hmm. they glorified mm -hmm. God, and they were filled with fear. Now, the man had faith, but he wasn't able to get to Jesus without stretcher bearers. And four of his friends assumed that responsibility. You know, sometimes the circumstances of life overwhelm us. Maybe you've had a child who has been killed. Maybe you've had a diagnosis of stage four cancer or your spouse has. Mm. Sometimes maybe a storm went through and washed away your, or, or burned up your home and everything that's in mm. it. Sometimes circumstances interfere, our emotional instability, if you will, interferes with our ability to press into God's presence. Sometimes we need stretcher bearers yeah. to bring us into his presence. I believe those who intercede for others, those who pray with others, who when you see someone who is needy, someone who is hurting, it doesn't have to be a physical way that you're carrying them to Jesus. It could be as simple as interceding for them in prayer, mm -hmm. praying with them to usher them into the presence. Those people, I think of our pastoral <coughs> department as stretcher bearers. Yes. People call here and they find it impossible to get to the Lord. But here's what this, this quarterly says. Jesus himself demonstrates how to help the helpless and is calling us to do the same. First, we become their friends, then we learn about their needs, and finally, we lead them to Jesus, who is the only one who can help them. This is what the men in this story did. We need to do likewise in whatever situation we find ourselves. Help lead people to the only one who can help them. Amen. Thank you so much, Shelley. That was a powerful lesson, a great start uh, to get us started during this week. And I'm Ryan Day. I have Monday's lesson, and I'm so thrilled to have this because uh, this message is dear to my heart. The title of Monday's lesson is Christ's Method Alone. And uh, I use this method because it's the only method, as we're about to find out, that, that gives true success in reaching people. And uh, when I go and travel, and sometimes I'm invited to give evangelistic trainings, outreach trainings, and how to teach an evangelism cycle in, in local churches, um, this comes up over and over and over. So I, I encourage you, my, my friends, to tune in. This is important for us to understand. Let's go to John chapter 5. We're going to start there with uh, a, a, a precious story. I love the story in Scripture. Uh, it really just shows us the heart of Jesus and wanting to meet the needs of those uh, who are in need. Uh, and uh, in John chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1 and we're going to read through to verse 9. The Bible says here that after this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, mm -hmm. uh, having five porches. <laughs> In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Mm. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Then the sick man answered and said, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, 
let me give you a Bible study and then I will heal you. <laughs> Is that what it says here? No. no. Mm -hmm. Notice what it says. Then Jesus said to him, rise up, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Now I was obviously being a little sarcastic when I said that one line. I, I said that for a reason because uh, this lesson is entitled Christ method alone. If we're going to reach the needy or anyone for that matter, uh, Christ method alone is what brings true success. And those aren't my words. This comes from Ministry of Healing, page 143. Listen very carefully to what the inspired words say. It says Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. So how many methods are there that actually work? One. 27, right? Whatever method did you think? No. Whatever method that we feel or believe is the right method may not necessarily be the right method in reaching people. There's only one, and that's the only way uh, that's right, and that's Christ's method, Christ's way. But what is Christ's method alone? It tells us here, Ministry of Healing, page 143. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. So he mingled with them. He showed his sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then he bid them or bade them to follow him. Uh, so let's break this down. There are five different things that we must follow in order to properly and rightfully reach someone for Christ. I only say this because many times we, I, I have been to many small group Bible studies, I've been visiting many churches, um, and I have heard this come across so many times from many different people. And that is, you'll hear often people say, well, how many Bible studies did you get this week? Mm -hmm. and, and understand, I, I am the largest proponent of Bible studies. I love small group Bible studies. Anytime that we have an opportunity to share the Word of God, we should be sharing. And so please don't get me wrong in what I'm about to say. But oftentimes we become so Bible study centralized or focused that we forget the proper steps that need to be taken before the person we're witnessing to is ready to receive the seed that needs to be sown. Take, take for yourself the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower goes out to sow. Some falls by the wayside, some stony ground, some uh, among the thorns, and some among good ground. But notice before that seed can be sown, and I usually ask this, people this when I give these evangelistic trainings or even at my evangelistic series, I'll say, how many of you have a garden or have, have ever ran a garden or prepared a garden? And you know, people will raise their hands and I'll say, okay, how many of you before you do anything else, the first step you do, you go into the cabinet or go into wherever you keep seed, you grab that seed and you just go out to the naked ground and you just start tossing seeds all over the place. No, you don't do that. That's silly, right? And before you sow the seed, you have to prepare the soil. There are some processes that must take place before the soil is ready to receive the seed, for the seed to do what it can do best. And that's, of course, sprout and then grow into something that you can harvest. The same message and the same principles apply to witnessing and mission. We must make sure that we take the proper processes to make sure that we are going to be that we are going to be a success and successful in reaching souls for Jesus. Mm -hmm. The first thing that we must do is what Jesus did. Jesus just didn't go out, you know, slamming people with Bible studies and, and theological concepts and all these things because they just need to hear it. He was he only did that when those people were ready to receive it. Mm -hmm. The first thing he did, according to Christ's method alone, was that he mingled. And it says here, the lesson says, first we must mingle with the help spend time getting to know them and understand their needs with the intention of doing good for them, spending time with them. How can you get someone to trust you to give them the truth if you haven't gotten to know them, if you haven't become a friend to them first? You, get, you have to become a friend. You have to spend time with them and gain that trust before they're willing to listen to you, to speak to them or to teach them the truth. Secondly, we must show sympathy to them. Okay, we need to show sympathy. Are you showing sympathy to those who are in need? This can be challenging. The lesson says in some cases because of distrust and because sometimes people use kindness as a means of winning the confidence of someone whom they later abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that can be an issue and I have experienced that myself. Nevertheless, it says God is calling us to show sympathy without expecting anything in return. 
We show sympathy because he showed sympathy. He showed sympathy to you. He showed sympathy to me. If we're not showing sympathy for others, then my friends, we're not doing the proper methods in reaching the soul for the kingdom of God. The third step to, uh, to minister to is through their needs. We need to minister to their needs. Do you care about the needs of others? This involves more than just words. And I've heard many times a brother or sister go to someone and say, you know, I, I really need help with this or I really need help with that or I'm struggling in this area. And oftentimes we kind of give those empty words of, well, I'm sorry you're going through that. I'm going to pray for you. I mean, don't get me wrong. I know we mean well when we say those type of things, but many times God's way of ministering to that person is more than just giving words like, I'm going to pray for you, but rather doing something about it to meet those needs is what we need to do. Then the fourth step is winning their confidence. Once you've mingled with them, once you've showed sympathy, once you have met their needs, you will win their confidence. When we minister to people, we help them and, and and they will learn to trust us and what we say to them so that when we talk to them about Jesus, they will be more open to listen. And then, of course, the last step, this is where Bible study comes in, because once you've gained their trust and won their confidence, the last step is, of course, to lead them to Jesus, an act that requires faith from both you and the one whom you help. And so, my friends, we have to learn to prepare that soil. We have to learn to go through these processes. Christ's method alone, that's the only appropriate way in order for us to go into the field and to be successful. But you know, many people are not in the fields as they should be. We want to sit at the table. We want to be at the Father's table, but we're not willing to go into the field and do what is necessary. As I was preparing this lesson, I thought of that Probably, and there's no other song that has ever been written that's more true than that of the song written by Lenny Wolf, My House is Full. Listen to the words of this song. I love this. It says, push away from the table. Look out through the window pane. Just beyond the house of plenty lies a field of golden grain. And it's ripe unto harvest, but the reapers, where are they in the house? Oh, can't the children hear the father sadly say? And then the chorus, sad but true, my house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work? for me today it seems my children all want to stay around my table but no one wants to work in my field yes no one wants to work in my field it's sad but it's true many times i want to reap of the benefits at the table where the Father is. But my friends, until that time, we need to know that it's our mission to collaborate with Him and going out into the field, using Christ's method alone, meeting the needs of others, mingling with them, showing those sympathies, gaining the confidence of our brothers and sisters who were in need. And then once we have won that confidence, bidding them to follow Jesus, sharing the good news, the gospel of Jesus. And then one day Jesus will come back. He'll gather us all at the harvest and we will sit at the Father's table. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, Ryan. Stay tuned. We'll be back in 30 seconds after this announcement of how you can find our website and watch every Sabbath School panel program that's ever been recorded. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Avian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3AVNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Now we'll continue this wonderful study and James Rafferty has our next lesson. Thank you, Shelley. We are in Tuesday's lesson and it's entitled Refugees and Immigrants. The Quarterly says the topic of immigrants and refugees has become a hotly debated subject, especially because there are so many of them today. Thank you, Shelley, for this lesson. Whether displaced by war or natural disasters or for the hope of a better economic future, millions around the world have been uprooted from their homes and are in desperate need of help. Now, the quarterly says in Matthew 2, 13 and 14, Jesus was a refugee. Just stop there and think about that. Jesus was a mm. refugee. And when you think about that, 
His earthly parents, Joseph and Mary, were forced to flee from Bethlehem by night, seek refuge in Egypt to escape a murderous hand of a ruler named Herod. So they were seeking political asylum. Jesus was a refugee. In fact, all of us are refugees. Unless we were born in the Middle East and our family goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, all of us are refugees. You know, Noah was a refugee in a sense, having to leave his land because of the flood. And we all come from Noah. Even natives are refugees at some point or another. I know my mom was a refugee from Ireland. Well, I should say she was an immigrant from Ireland. There's a difference. Immigra immigrated when she was 14 years old to the United States, sponsored by my aunt and then my father. My father was a refugee of sorts. Uh, originally from Africa, I don't know how many years back, and of course he was brought over in slavery. So all of us have this connection going all the way back, and therefore Christ comes as us. He comes as a refugee. He comes as one who needs asylum. He comes to the place where we are. He comes to relate to us, and Joseph and Mary, his parents, have fled to Egypt. Now, as they escape the murderous hand of Herod, the quarterly goes on to say, the Bible says nothing about their experience in Egypt, but it's not hard to imagine that it was challenging. Can you imagine being a Hebrew, being a Jew and going to Egypt, you know, a country that has a different culture, different religion, different background? And um, these challenges, of course, face refugees today, the quarterly goes on to say. In fact, somewhat parallel to how Jesus' family sought asylum in a foreign land, many Muslims, many Buddhists, many Hindus, many Christians, mm -hmm. many, many non-religious persons are seeking asylum in new lands today as well. So Joseph and Mary went to Egypt, but they went to Egypt temporarily. That's what the Bible tells us. Mm -hmm. Like them, there are also immigrants who do not want to stay permanently. They're looking for temporary relief from a difficult situation. When I went to Pakistan years ago, there were hundreds of thousands of refugees from Afghanistan in wow. Pakistan. They were intense. They weren't planning to stay in Pakistan. They wanted to go back to Afghanistan, but temporarily they were taking refuge and asylum in Pakistan. And often it's for political reasons. Uh, sometimes, of course, it's due to war or famine. Some have resources, some have work skills, some plan to go back to their country when their time is right. This has been the case of many in the Bible. Abraham, for example, took refuge in Egypt for a time, yeah. right? So did Jacob. Jacob and his sons, under God's leading in Joseph's captivity, ended up in Egypt for a time. But they talked about the day when they would go back to the country God had ordained yeah. for them. Even Joseph and Mary sought asylum in this foreign land with the laws and the customs that were much different than their own for political reasons. Their resources were, were gold and, and some, you know, spices given to them by the wise men. And Joseph was a carpenter, which, of course, is a skill that can be uh, used anywhere. You can find work as a carpenter. So they had some skills they brought with them. Jacob, too, was an immigrant early in his life who went back to his distant family ties in Syria mm. as he fled from his brother Esau. And Jacob had nothing, not even a change of clothes. He had nothing. And yet he was willing to work hard seven years for one wife and another seven years for another. Okay. Uh, but, and he was even taken advantage by his uncle Laban. And we can read that in Genesis chapters 28 through 31. But the reality is this. As true believers, we are actually immigrants in this present world, mm -hmm. right? True Christians are all seeking asylum from the prince of this world. <laughs> so as Christians, we're all seeking refuge. Mm -hmm. The prince of this world, his presidents, his prime ministers, his kings. True Christians are all being persecuted, hated, mistreated, generally displaced. We are pilgrims and strangers in this present world, tearing but a night here in this country so dark and dreary, I have long wandered forlorn and weary. I'm a pilgrim, mm. I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. There is a city to which I journey. My redeemer, my redeemer is its light. There is no sorrow, nor any crying, nor any tears, nor any dying. We are pilgrims, we are strangers. We can tarry, we can tarry but a night. Mm. So Jesus came to us as us. The place that we're going, of course, is the heavenly Jerusalem. It's not another country or another place on planet Earth. Eventually, we're going to be in that new heaven, in that new earth. And this heavenly Jerusalem actually has an immigration policy. <laughs> you can't just show up at its borders and expect to walk in. Yeah. 
<laughs> you are definitely not getting in if you're bringing in lawlessness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The heavenly country requires loving service from all who enter there. Criminals against God's law are not welcome. If you want to live off the government of that heavenly land flowing with milk and honey without reciprocating, you will not be welcome there. Mm -hmm. Every immigrant entering the glorious land must show that they will be obedient to the laws and principles of its government. Mm -hmm. The law of loving service is foundational to this country, this heavenly country of liberty for all, and the ruler within its borders, the highest representative of its government, the God of heaven, the true and coming ruler of this earth made new is also a servant. <laughs> In fact, he will welcome each one of us with a grand feast and all who want this better life, all who are honestly seeking asylum from the, the spiritual darkness of this present world will all have a place at his table and he, the king of heaven and earth, will serve mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He will serve us. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Have you noticed how true Christianity crosses all racial and cultural borders? I mean, I've traveled the world. I've been to Europe and Asia, Middle East and Africa. I've been to South and Central America and always found a place of refuge among God's true people, always. In our local church, we have members from every ethnic background, Asian, black, Hispanic, yes, and even white. And we are family. We are family. Amen. Here at 3ABN, located in Southern Illinois, we experience this merging of race and culture and ethnicity as one body in Christ, ready to serve. Amen. You see, it's the devil that's seeking to divide us. Amen. The devil that's seeking to put up these barriers between these races and cultures. We are one. We are one family. The Bible says, wherefore, remember Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, that ye being in time past gentles and Gentiles in the flesh who were called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time that you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes afar off are made, afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Yeah. Mm. For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments containing ordinances, for to make in himself of the two one new man making peace. Mm -hmm. That ye might be reconciled both unto God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And he came and he preached peace to you which were afar off and them which were near, so that through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are built together for a habitation of God. Mm. Generally speaking, the gospel does more than call us out of ethnic comfort zones. The gospel moves us out. It compels us, it propels us, it completely obliterates worldly walls of separation and unites people in its melting pot of nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples. Soon all the immigrants of this world will find entrance into the heavenly borders and experience the eternal life of loving service and tireless energy so hoped for and longed for in this present world. So there we are, we're pilgrims and strangers, and yet God has brought us together. He's brought us together under his government, under the principles of love and service. He's united us mm -hmm. as a family. He's broken down all ethnic racial borders and lines and distinctions, and he's recovered us to what he began for us yes. in the Garden of Eden. And each one of us is called to enter into that experience in our own personal relationship and how we, we react and relate to others. Jesus Christ himself entered into that experience and he calls us to abide in him and to experience that loving relationship with him and with others. Amen. 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 Yeah. Great stuff. Powerful lesson. Thank you, Pastor James. I'm Daniel Perrin. I have Wednesday's lesson to help the hurting. Now, it really doesn't matter how well off someone is or how good they seem to have it. This world is full of hurting people and there's all kinds of hurting. Marriages and parenting and uh, regrets and loneliness, mm -hmm. health and finances, the painful past. And, and as I, I say these words, I know that I'm touching people who are watching and listening and you're saying, that's me. 
I'm hurting. Which is why that song, People Need the Lord, touches a chord with people, still does. Mm -hmm. These opening words, every day they pass me by. I can see it in their eye. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. Mm -hmm. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. Mm. To these people, Jesus had a mission. Mm. That mission was himself. Mm. Amen. To these people today, Jesus has a mission. And it's still himself ministered through you and me, us as a church. Which is why the title of, for this lesson's quarterly is so good. God's mission, my mission. Mm -hmm. They're one and the same. And Jesus' mission, Luke 4, verse 18, he's showing us that his mission was already predicted long in advance, quoting Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I love this line here. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Yes. People who are hurting. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who who are oppressed. I want to give just a few snapshots of what that looked like and can look like and is to look like in our lives. Mark 1, 41. I love this text right here. Then Jesus moved with compassion, yes. stretched out his hand and touched him. And he said, I am willing, be cleansed. You don't have to be a miracle worker. You don't have to have a four-year degree to have compassion, Amen. to stretch out your hand, to touch someone. Almost anybody can do that. There are people in our churches who have not been hugged in years, no. perhaps even since childhood. I think about going to a nursing home as, as I do with my family on a Sabbath once a month with our church. And uh, we sing, we pray, we talk, and then we go from person to person yes. and ask them questions and let them talk and hold their hand. And my kids make a little card, the little Sabbath school they're a part of makes little cards and hands them out. And we could cut that time short, but oh, how precious that is for people who some of them say, no, nobody comes to visit me. Yeah. The, the financial vice principal at the school where I worked had a sign in his office that said, the right answer is compassion. Amen. Mm. I That's took right. that and I put it in my office too because I want to be like that. Mm. I like that. John chapter 4, I, I love that chapter where Jesus talks with this Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, as I understand it, she was the reason he went there, that through her then ministry to this entire community. And he takes his time with a conversation, responding to the questions that she raises. He's not rushing through, he's sitting there as long as it takes. Turn to this next one here. You've got to see this text in Luke 4, verse 40. As you get there, Luke 4, verse 40, it's already been a day of preaching, and that's exhausting. Casting out demons in a church, rebuking illness. And we get to this phrase right here. When the sun was setting, all those who had any, uh, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He laid his hands on every one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It's not just a pat on the back. Mm -hmm. This is a conversation. Mm -hmm. How's it been for you? Mm -hmm. It's been hard. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't tell my family what it's like because I don't want to be a burden to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus with his hand on their shoulder, listening, wiping tears out of his own eyes, out of theirs. Mm. I, I, know I, I know I could learn to live with this. I know other people have it worse than I do, but mm. I don't know how much longer I can handle it. And Jesus laying his hands on each one of them, mm. coming close, ministering to them, not rushing through it. Mm. He listens. You know this text in Hebrews 4, 15, in the King James Version. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, touched. The word is sympatheo, to sympathy. No feeling that we go through, he does not have an experiential grasp on. He came down and took all of our weakness upon himself and went through it. So whatever they were going through, as he laid his hands upon them, which we can do, 
in compassion. He understood what they were going through, walked through all the defilement of this earth, all the sin, and yet he himself was without sin, and that gives us power to be victorious over sin. Luke chapter 8, a few more pages onward, verse 41, thinking about Jesus who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Luke 8, verse 41. I love how we've covered different stories here. Here's another one. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Mm. Jesus, who is touched by the feeling of our infirmities, who has compassion, do you think he just said, okay, let's go to your house? <laughs> no, with his arm around him, with tears in his eyes, he understands what it's like to have a family of children who are in danger. And I believe that <laughs> Jairus was rushing and hustling as fast as he could, saying, will Jesus walk as fast as me? And it's at that point when this other woman touches the hem of his garment. We can't do all the details of the story, but immediately she is healed. And I got to believe that in that moment, she in sobs, everything in her life has changed. Mm -hmm. And Jesus stops and he has a conversation with her while Jairus is saying, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, she's healed, come on. And Jesus says, how's it been for you? For 12 years, it's been so hard. Mm. Mm. Your faith has made you well. At yeah. that point, verse 49, while he was still speaking, someone came to the ruler of the synagogue's house, that's Jairus, saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. Mm. And here's a man, like any one of us, who crumples in sobs on the ground. Mm. And Jesus doesn't just, there in verse 50, Jesus says, do not be afraid, only believe she will be made well. I don't see a Jesus standing afar off saying, come on, let's go. <laughs> he has compassion. He comes close to the people. He comes near where they are. Isaiah 53, verse 4, Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. This is what we are referring to when we talk about true medical missionary work. I talked to somebody just recently about being a medical missionary and he said, I, I get queasy at the sight of people on the operating table. A medical missionary is more than just dealing with physical ailments. And yes, we are to become knowledgeable in the natural means God has given us to preserve and, and to heal. But put simply, medical missionary work is pure unselfishness. Mm -hmm. meeting the needs of people where they are, their physical needs, social needs, emotional needs, in order to bring them to Christ, the great healer, the only healer. Mm -hmm. Christ is no longer in this world physically, and so we then represent him as the true medical missionary. Three statements I want to share with you. First, in second, seventh volume of the Testimonies for the Church, page 62, we have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. Hmm. Think of how inclusive this statement is. Yes. Every one of us is to be doing medical missionary work. Hmm. Medical ministry, page 238 says, to take the people right where they are, whatever their position, whatever their condition, and help them in any way possible. This is gospel ministry. Hmm. We begin by coming close to the people. Medical ministry, page 20, Christ stands before us as the pattern man, the great medical missionary, and an, an example to all who should come after. And what this means is that we then need to see people in the way that God sees them. Do we see them as somebody who God really loves? Or do we count them off and, and write them off in some way? Remember that uh, even while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ has compassion, grace upon us. Yeah. There is no person that Jesus looks at out there and says, nope, write them off. I'm not going to go after that one. And so as we come close to the people, we minister to them as Jesus did, as a true medical missionary, seeing their needs and then asking the Lord to help us help them. Mm. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was really powerful. I hope I can get through my lesson here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pastor James, Ryan, Shelley. It's a powerful lesson mm -hmm. because this is practical Christianity. Mm -hmm. This is where the rubber meets the road. 
and God calls us to be his missionaries with others. I'm Jill Morricone. On Thursday, we look at greater love. Thank you, Shelley, for my lesson. The verse I have is John 15, verse 13. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life mm -hmm. for his friends. I divided the lesson in three different sections, all to me related in some fashion to love. The first section is called Compassion Fatigue which is kind of the flip side of what you just talked about. How to love when you're weary and overwhelmed. The second part is reaching the unlovable. How to love those people you don't naturally like. And the third is loving to the limit. How can we love even at the cost of life itself? So let's start with the first one, compassion fatigue. How do we love when we're weary and overwhelmed? They say that compassion fatigue is described by the physical, emotional, and psychological impact of helping other people. It can occur when a nurse works in a cancer ward mm. or a pediatric cancer ward and sees little kids who are dying every day. It can occur when a teacher works with underprivileged children, when a counselor takes on the problems of others, when we're somehow overwhelmed with the need and don't know what to do about it. It could be a physical need, like a caregiver, and you're constantly ministering to someone's physical need. Mm. It could be an emotional need. Maybe you have a needy friend, and you feel like you're constantly ministering to their emotional needs. Sometimes it even comes when we watch the news, and we see the trauma that occurs in this world. To be honest with you, if I'm being transparent, I've experienced it the more you step into leadership, mm -hmm. the more it can seem that people ask or people want or you can start to experience that as well. Compassion fatigue is a feeling of helplessness in the face of suffering. It's feeling detached, numb, emotionally disconnected. Mm -hmm. How do we love when we're weary or we're overwhelmed? Number one, Turn toward other people's pain, not away from it. Now, the natural response is to turn away. I don't want to feel it. I want to protect myself. I want to be callous. I want to insulate myself. I think of Isaiah 53, verse 3. I like this in the New Living Translation. He was despised and rejected. This is talking about Jesus, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Sometimes we want to hide from pain because it's difficult to face it squarely in the face. It's difficult to see it and we just want to turn ourselves away. Yet Psalm 34 verse 18, the Lord is near those who have a broken heart and he saves such as have a contrite spirit. God draws near to pain. He doesn't turn away from it. So the first key your natural response is to turn away, but don't do that. Turn toward pain. The second, allow God to give you sympathy for others. Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Enter into and experience the emotions of others. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And finally, number three, recognize that pain does not last forever. This world is not all there is. I think of Revelation 21 verse four, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There'll be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Mm -hmm. So if you're dealing with compassion fatigue, turn toward pain, not away from it. Allow God to give you sympathy for others and recognize that pain will not last forever. But how do we reach the unlovable? How do we love those who we don't naturally like? Pastor James Rafferty did a whole sermon on that. I remember that, which was incredible. We don't have time for all that. We're going to look at just one Bible passage. We're going to Matthew chapter 5. This is the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has given these antithetical contrasting statements 
remember those. Like you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say don't even lust after a woman. Or you've heard that it was said do not kill someone, but I say don't even hate other people. Mm -hmm. So we see this contrasting statement here with loving those people we don't naturally like. And from it, I get four steps four steps how we can love those we don't naturally like. Number one, recognize that love is a principle, not a feeling. Mm. Or in Matthew 5, 43, mm. you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. You see, it's a command of God. Mm -hmm. First John 4, verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, mm. we also ought to love one another. Mm. It's not optional. It's not whether we feel like it. God simply says, you are called, Jill, to love other people and love specifically those people that you don't naturally like. Remember this, I love this, and I try to think about it when I find and come up against somebody that you haven't rubbed with. If you were able to see everything that that person has been through in their life, you wouldn't help but be able to love them as Jesus does. Mm. In other words, if you could see their baggage, if you could see their pain, if you could see their past, if you could see their insecurities, if you could see what they struggle with, all those things we hide from other people, mm. you'd be led to see, oh wow, I have more love and compassion for them. Mm. Recognize that love is a principle, not a feeling. Number two, speak with kindness. I say to you, we're still in Matthew 5:44. Love your enemies, that's the command, love. And then it says, bless those who curse you. Our natural response is to respond with hate or irritation or negativity or criticism or judgment or the cold shoulder treatment. Instead, we're to react with kindness. Again, this is a principle, not a feeling. Mm -hmm. We don't have to feel kind to speak kind. Mm -hmm. It's a principle. Next, number three, we act with goodness. Keep going to Matthew 5, 44. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you that speak with kindness. Do good to those who hate you. You know, they say actions, they speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. And there's truth in that. We could say, oh yes, and I could speak kind words to you. But yeah, if my actions don't follow, you would doubt the words, would you not? And you'd say, well, I'm not sure if Jill really meant that because her actions don't follow that. Again, when we think about actions, this is a choice. This is a principle. It's not based on a feeling to act kindly or well toward other people. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians 13. It says, love suffers long and is kind. These are actions of love. Love does not envy. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And finally, number four, going back to Matthew 5, verse 44, we pray for those that we don't like. Mm -hmm. So we love our enemies, that's the command from God. We bless those, in other words, we speak kindly to them. We do good to them. We follow up the kind words with actions. And then we pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And finally, how do we love to the limit? How do we love at the cost of love, life itself? There's no way that we can do that except following the example of Jesus. Jesus demonstrated, God demonstrated his own love for us, mm -hmm. Romans 5, 8. And that while we were still sinners, yet even now sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. We can only love because Christ puts his love in our hearts mm -hmm. and in our lives. Who is God calling you to love today? Who is in your community, your home that he wants you to love? We have our challenge on Thursday. Learn about others in your community. It could be foreigners, it could be refugees, it could be non-Christians, people of another culture. Find unreached people groups in your own community. And then the challenge up is to identify one specific person. So it doesn't have to be this grand thing. We have to go to the whole world. Identify one person that God wants you to pray for. God wants you to reach out for. 
God wants you to meet their needs, as Ryan talked about. God wants you to have compassion on. God wants you to love. And then you can introduce them to Jesus. Amen. Oh, thank you, Jill. And thank you for covering the challenge because the challenge is how we take the knowledge that we are learning here and put it into practice. And that's what this is all about. I feel that this has been such a beautiful study. We've mm -hmm. got a saying that we've had church, but we've got just a moment for a quick final thought from each person. Amen. You know, the text that comes to my mind is Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and onward. It says, uh, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the God we serve, a loving, kind, compassionate Lord. And as we've learned today, He is the one we're seeking. He's the one we're trying to implement and to be like. And those are the, He is the person that we're supposed to be projecting for the world to see in us. Amen. You know, we're all immigrants and refugees really as Christians and believers, pilgrims and strangers here. And Jesus himself became an immigrant to planet Earth from heaven. He became a refugee as we read there in his early story. And to be a Christian, to be like Christ, we should have more sympathy and more understanding with immigrants, with refugees, and therefore reach out to them and encourage them to look to a better world. What would you give to spend an hour with Jesus? Mm. When we minister to the needy, we are interacting directly with Jesus. Matthew 25, 40. Then the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I tell you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. Amen. First John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death to life mm. because we love the brethren. Mm. You know if you are truly converted in, in Jesus, if you have love for those around you. Mm. Amen. amen and amen. And just remember that we can all be stretcher bearers. The faith of friends uh, is so important. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need a stretcher bearer and other times we can be one. Well, we hope you have enjoyed this wonderful lesson, Mission to the Needy. And next week we will continue and we're going to go from Mission to the Needy mm -hmm. to Mission to the Powerful. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes that can be more difficult mm -hmm. than the earlier. So. What our prayer is for you is that you'll join us next week, that the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you always.